It's really amazing to be here. For those of you who don't know, uh, AppNexus is Girls Who Code's home. We have had our office here since 2012 when we were like one person to today when we have 50. So it's awesome to be here. I wanted to just briefly talk a little bit about kind of my work and how I'm a really weird person to be leading a movement to teach girls to code. So I'm not a coder. I did not major in computer science. In fact, I was one of those girls that was terrified of math and science growing up. My father would often like sit me at the dinner table and he'd say, what's two plus two? And I'd be like, five. And he'd be like, okay, you're not gonna be an engineer. <laughs> I found my way to this topic through failure. My parents came here as refugees in 1973. And they were two of a thousand refugees who got status to come here from Uganda because they were engineers. And in the 1970s, this country was desperately seeking engineers. And no matter how tired my father was, every night he would sit me on his lap and he'd read to me about Dr. King and Mahatma Gandhi, Eleanor Roosevelt. So I knew from a very young age that I wanted to give back, that I wanted to give back to this nation that had literally saved my parents' life. And the way that I thought that I would do that would be through public service. Well, at age 33, I found myself working in finance, so like the opposite of public service. <laughs> $300,000 in student loan debt, coming home every night in the fetal position, watching CNN and drinking a large bottle of wine. I hated my job. And it was 2008, and I was watching my mentor, Hillary Clinton, give her first concession speech. And she had this line where she said, you know, just because I failed doesn't mean you shouldn't try to. And I literally felt like she was speaking to me. So I walked into my boss's office and I quit. And at age 33, I decided to run for United States Congress in a New York City Democratic primary against an 18-year incumbent because I thought that that was a great idea. I had like a 1% chance of winning, a thousand page policy book. And I remember the only thing my friends and I knew how to do was build a website. And we built one. And we raised like $50,000 from Indian aunties that were just so happy an Indian girl was running for office. <laughs> but it was the best 10 months of my life. And on election day, as I sat there in my victory party that never ended up happening, and the election returns came in, I had lost. I mean, I had lost miserably. Less than 19% of the vote. I spent $1.4 million on 12 hundred votes. I was broke. I was humiliated. I had pissed off everybody in the Democratic establishment, and I had no contingency plan. But what was interesting is, as I was going to bed that night through the tears, you know, the only faces that I kept seeing were actually ones that I had never met. Because when you run for office, you end up going to a lot of schools. And I'd go into robotics classes and computer science classes, and I'd see a ton of boys. And I thought to myself, like, where are the girls? You know, it didn't make sense to me, and I probably had my father's voice in my ear. You know, my dad used to always say to me when I was growing up, Reshma, you have three choices. You can be a doctor, a lawyer, or an engineer because he wanted me to get a job where I could make a great wage, buy a house, get a dog. We're not having this conversation with young people today. You know, there's 500,000 open jobs in computing and tech. You can make $120,000 as a software programmer. 71% of these STEM jobs we kept, keep talking about are actually in computing. And the vast majority of these jobs are not in New York City or in Silicon Valley. They're in Montana, 
in Delaware, Nebraska. And, and the problem is, is that last year as a country, we only graduated 40,000 computer science graduates. Compare that to China, which graduated 350,000 engineers. You, you talk to any CEO in the country, and I don't care if they're in retail, finance, oil, they'll tell you that their number one problem is they can't hire enough engineers, programmers. I think the solution to this tech talent pipeline is women, right? Women today make up the majority in college, the majority in labor force. We're 45% of America's breadwinners. You go into any county, town, parish, and it's women who are paying the mortgage, who are putting food on the table. Problem is, is that less than 18% of our technology workforce is female. If you go into a computer science classroom, less than two out of 10 will be girls. And the crazy thing is, is it wasn't always this way. You know, in the 1980s, if 40% of computer science graduates were women. So if you walked into NYU's CS class, it pretty much would have been half girls. If you walked into a Atari's gaming camp, it would have been half girls. And then slowly you had this decline from 37% to 18%. And people always ask me, like, why? Like, what happened? How is it that at a time where technology is a huge part of everything we do, we're losing women? And, and the first reason is, is culture, right? I was just in Chicago two days ago and I spoke to about a 200 girls from third grade to sixth grade. And I said to them, describe me what a computer scientist looks like. And the first girl said, it's a boy. Second girl said, he wears glasses. The third girl says, he wears a suit. And I was like, oh, no, no, that's wrong. But, <laughs> but basically, right, we know him, right? He's sitting in a basement, he's drinking a Red Bull, he hasn't showered, right? He's staring at a computer screen. And little girls look at this image and they say, not only do I not want to be him, I don't even want to be friends with him. Culture plays a huge role. And we see the reason why every girl, whatever city or state you are in, can describe him to a T is because she sees him on television. And we saw him on television. We saw him on Revenge of the Nerds and Weird Science, right? War games. Today, little girls see him on Silicon Valley, on HBO. And images matter. You know, I'm an attorney because I watched this movie, The Accused, and I saw Kelly McGillis. Do you remember her? She's awesome. I was like, she is smart, funny, interesting. I wanted to be just like her. But we forget that in the 1970s, 10% of doctors and lawyers were women, 10%. If I asked each of you to describe me, or those same girls, sorry, to describe what a doctor or a lawyer looks like, they would probably describe us in this room. Why? Allie McBeal, Grey's Anatomy, LA Law. In the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, little girls were inundated with these amazing images of women that were doctors and lawyers, and they said, me too. I wanna do that. The opposite thing has happened in technology. And it doesn't help that we have a Barbie doll that says, I hate math, let's go shopping instead. Or the fact that we can you know, buy a t-shirt at Forever 21 that says I'm allergic to algebra. Or watch Mean Girls, which I'm sure we all watch on repeat. I mean, I definitely do. But that scene, right, where she has, gets you know, a D on her math test and she crosses it out. I mean, she gets an A on her math test and crosses it out to a D just to get the affections of a boy. We celebrate this narrative that girls are bad at math, even though it's a skill set that they need to survive in the 21st century. The other thing I've been thinking about and writing a lot about is this idea that you know, we raise our girls to be perfect and we raise our boys to be brave. You know, at a very young age, we teach our girls to smile pretty, play it safe, 
get all A's. And we teach our boys to like crawl to the top of the monkey bars and just jump. I have a two and a half year old son. When I found out I had a boy, I cried because it was very off brand. But, <laughs> but I'm feeling better about it now. Thank you. Um, but so, you know, they always say like, God gives you what you need. And he certainly did here because I see, I see, I watch his, how things play out, how gender plays out at such a young age. And I think about my son's swim class and it's like half boys, half girls. And when, you know, the boys are learning, when the girls are learning how to swim, all the parents are like, it's okay, honey. You don't have to get your face wet. Don't be scared. And with the boys, they're just like pushing them into the deep end at six months because they're trying to teach them how to be men, how to be fearless, how to be risk takers. And when these little boys, they grow up into men, they're the ones, right? We see them. They raise their hand for projects that they know nothing about. They hit on us at a bar. We tell them to piss off. They keep doing it. They don't care. <laughs> like, rejection doesn't bother them. But us, not so much. Because we've been raised to be perfect, to be liked, to be kind, we're not comfortable with rejection. We're not comfortable with failure. The first time we get it in college, in the form of a college rejection letter, fall apart. Or when we get feedback that we don't like at work, we end up in the bathroom crying. It feels personal. We think to ourselves, well, if I can't get it perfectly right, why bother to even try? And this perfectionism, quite frankly, is creating a massive mental health crisis. The number of suicides of young girls, you know, between the ages of 15 to 20 have skyrocketed. All of us know women, our friends, maybe ourselves, that are addicted to pain medication because we just can't bear to face our imperfect life. So the amazing thing about coding is that it teaches imperfection. Like many girls that come to our classroom, they think that they can't do it, that they're not smart enough, that they're not good enough. And when they do, it's like a light turns on. And they learn how to not give up before they've even tried. And that lesson is so powerful for them for the rest of their life. And I, and I see leaders being born every day in our classrooms that learn how to be brave through code. So I know it's possible. You know, I'm a feminist with a capital F, but you know, I don't do this work because I believe in gender parity for the sake of gender parity. Now, I do this work because I see girls every day that are using their technology school tools to make the world a little bit better. You know, I think about Cora, who was five years old when her daddy got diagnosed with cancer. And at Girls of Code, she built an algorithm to help detect whether a cancer is benign or malignant to save her father's life. You know, I think about Lucy and Maya, who are 10 years old, who snuck into their parents' basement and watched CNN and saw that kids were dying because they were drinking the water in Flint, Michigan. And so these two girls from New Jersey decided to build an app to help those families. I think about Trisha Prabhu, who's one of our alums, who was being cyberbullied her whole life. And one day she read a story about an 11-year-old girl who climbed to the top of a building and jumped and killed herself. And Trisha said, you know, how could it be that at 11, you feel like you have no reason to go on? So she went and took that pain and went into her bedroom and built an app called Rethink. So every time you're about to send something that's not so nice, it asks you, are you sure you want to send this? I have 26 seconds, so I'm going to leave you with three things. One. And this isn't just about women in technology, but generally us as women. We need to learn how to be braver. 
And that to me means that we need to get comfortable with rejection. I've run for office twice, I've lost twice. Recently, I applied to my community board, which is kind of like the lowest level of political office, like everybody gets on their community board. Well, not me. So I <laughs> applied to the education committee thinking, of course, I'm gonna get on this committee, right? I know something about education. And sure enough, I get a letter in the mail that says you have been rejected. And that was painful, right? I mean, it was just like, like, like dog catcher. You know what I mean? It's like the, like the bottom, bottom, bottom of the, every, everybody gets on the community board, but not me. So I took that letter, and if you come to my house, it's on my refrigerator. And every day I look at that letter as a reminder of what I'm gonna achieve in my life and that nobody can tell me that I can't do something. So surround yourself with rejection. Surround yourself with it. Once you start exercising your bravery muscle, you'll never stop exercising your bravery muscle. I promise you. And that doesn't mean it doesn't hurt. It hurt to get that letter. But it doesn't stop me from being brave. I immunize myself to failure. And you can too. I think the second thing is, of course, teach the girls in your life, encourage them to learn how to code. Put every opportunity to make them tinker and to take things apart. And we need to do the same thing. For so long, even though I'm CEO of Girls Who Code, my husband is like my tech support, right? My phone breaks, I'm like, ah, you fix it for me, right? We get a new toy, I read the instructions. If I can't figure it out in two minutes, I pass it on. I stopped doing that. I stopped doing that. And now I watch a video or take the time to figure it out myself. And we all need to do that, not just as adults, but, but with our girls. Let's not make them afraid of tinkering, of taking things apart, of challenge. And the third thing is, and this is what I want to talk about AppNexus and Brian for a minute. You know, Brian O'Kelly is the CEO of AppNexus. And my, I landed here because I was calling him in, in, in 2011 for money for my campaign. And I was like, oh, and by the way, in addition to a $4,000 check, can you also give me some office space? Because Girls Who Code needed a home. And Brian said yes. And when Girls Who Code went from two employees to 10 employees and I needed a little bit more office space, Brian said yes. And when Girls Who Code went from 10 employees to 26 employees and I needed a lot more office space, Brian said yes. And we went from 26 to 50 employees and I needed an entire floor, Brian said yes. There are amazing, amazing male champions in this movement who need to be celebrated. And Brian O'Kelly is one of them. And we need to keep telling that story over and over and over again, because everything that we've seen in our industry over the past couple of months, the sexual harassment, the pay gap, it's not gonna change, not yet. But we in this room, we can't solve it by ourselves. We need the men to stand up and speak out and use their power and influence to make a difference. And when we see ones behaving well, we celebrate them. And when we see the ones that don't behave so well, we shame them and we bring them down. And we will do that with our power and influence. Thank you.